Hi, I'm Rob Vanstone. I'm blankly staring into the camera right now. And welcome to the 52nd edition of the Rider Rumblings video podcast. Each week we uh, use the volume number to pay tribute to some Rough Riders of yesteryear or of present who wore number f- the said number. So number 52 this week, Jim Hobson, Absolutely. obviously, Canadian Football Hall of Famer, 2019 Rider Plaza of Honor member, with numerous other distinctions, Barry Aldag, brother mm-hmm. of a Canadian Football Hall of Famer and a Plaza of Honor member Carmelo Carteri Carteri number 52 the writer's current number 52 is Murray Brandon Bartlett a two-year third year a third year supplemental pick I haven't noticed him yet at training camp but he's wearing 52 so good for him and uh Mitchell Blair from uh, 620 CKRM the sports cage um Who's trying to get his waist size beyond fifty two, <laughs> and is doing quite well. Yeah, good luck on that. Yeah, so. I'm fine. I know yes. the feeling. I don't know why you wouldn't have had Jim Hobson come in here today to add some talent to this show, being fifty two and everything. We should have done that. You should have. We had done we that. had Jim with us last year, and well, uh, I'll just leave him. We'll go get him. We'll do this later. Yeah, cut. All right. Um, um, that just, music. Are you going to use that for the provincial election and the federal election that, as well? That's, that's a that'd be a great wow, great uh, election song. It would be. Uh, we need a decision desk. We haven't yet uh, we haven't yet commissioned a decision desk. I guess this can be the actual desk. Have we got a decision desk on the 2019 Saskatchewan Rough Riders yet? Mur? Sure. What's your early What's your early ver- after after with one out of 789 <laughs> polls reporting? What is your assessment of the Rough Riders this year, Mur? They're going to be in tough. I think. Thanks, Mur. That's what else, Mur McCormick. Thank you. Okay. I go go ahead. <laughs> I'm still, Sorry. you know. Quarterback still remains a big question, and that's something that's going to be one until they prove themselves in the preseason, which doesn't mean much, but to the regular season, like Zach Claris, I know it was a mock game on Saturday, and the numbers got out there. And with Zach, I kept saying, Zach didn't look as bad as his numbers are, but their numbers don't lie, statistics, so they don't have that. I'm still waiting for a breakout receiver, and that's still something that's going to be someone, I don't know, maybe Roosevelt, but you know, maybe they're working the other guys in. and. Uh, Defensively, they're going to be stout, stout, solid. They're going to be the one of that that front four. Just when I watch it, but they don't, they haven't really played the starters a lot, so you don't really get a chance to see Micah Johnson, Zach Evans, and uh, Charleston Hughes and AC Leonard out there together. But just based on their numbers and their past performance, the front four is going to dominate and probably dictate how well this team goes ahead because they got some good linebackers, great secondary. We all know the defense is great, but somehow the offense has got to find some way to step up and contribute. More than they did last year. But mind you, we keep friend there twelve and four last year, eh, Rob, and made it by twelve home. and six. Twelve and six. Sorry, before my team's mixed up, and uh, hosted a playoff game. So like last year wasn't a complete disaster, but it could have been so much more if the offense had even been effective or something. I don't know what the board to describe what the offense was last year, but it's got to be better. Punt and grunt. I like that. Or grunt and punt. That's the best description I've heard of it. Mitch. Murray, you talked about Zach Caleros' performance at the scrimmage uh, this past weekend. We've heard the numbers as well. They weren't great. I believe it was one of ten. Yeah, but what a completion. Were they, what a completion. It was awful. Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, were these passes skipping in front of receivers? Were there drops? Were there overthrows? What happened on these uh, on these throws to make Zach Kalaros's numbers I not would, look great? I would lean towards more overthrows. That means he was not quite releasing the ball right. So it's more overthrows. And I you really hate to say, oh, Zach, it's all Zach's problem because you don't know what the receivers are doing. They, they, they're still learning. It was their first real live action. So you can't really blame Zach for passes being out of place. But then, you know, Cody Fajaro comes in and completes 9 of 13, I think it was. How many of Forgot that right that down, but so he didn't have any of his issues, but he wasn't going against the so-called number one. So yeah, the pat the incompletions were on Zach, mostly overthrows. That was the ones that seemed to stand out when they missed. Can you flip that and say that the 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 that the defense played well? <laughs> He's playing against a, I, a defense that you're lauding. Is yeah, can you, can you I, is it six of one half dozen of the other? Yeah, but I thought the defense was playing kind of soft initially. They didn't look they were, they were kind of letting the, the receivers catch the ball a little bit more than they would. And I, but Craig says no. He thought they were playing. And then as soon as I noticed that, then Marshall got the pick off of him, and the defense started to play a lot tougher and stuff. So yeah, let's go with that, Rob. I think you you made a found sound observation from uh, Regina. The defense was better, and Zach just wasn't quite. Sharp enough does it, to play. Does it matter? It's a scrimmage. 
and the preseason can be an absolute illusion. I, you know, Mitch referred to it in his in his blog today. I'm just not sure how much importance, if any, to attach to a controlled scrimmage. I do agree. get me to June 13th. Yeah, I I agree with that. But I think when the guy, the the micro or the spotlight is on, that being Zach Caleros, and he comes out and does not put up some great numbers. And I wasn't expecting Zach Kolaros to go 11 of 11 for 120 yards and two touchdowns, but I was expecting to see more than that. And I think those that went to the scrimmage were expecting to see more than that as well. Uh, I think there are a lot of people that are surprised that Zach Kolaros is back with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I'm surprised that he's back period, because I thought he probably should have hung it up after last year and the three concussions, but it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day, but if he goes out against the Calgary Stampeders, and I don't know how much he's going to play, but if he goes out against Calgary and puts up those numbers, I think we've got some legitimate concerns going into that second preseason game. Well, first off, Mitch, I'd be surprised if he played very much. I think they've, they've got to give Fajero, Watford, Harker, and uh, Ganji an opportunity to play. They, you know, really, and if you look back last year, you know, the, Zach doesn't need to play this one. He, regardless of what happens in this preseason game, he's a starting quarterback. So we, that question has, has long been answered. And does he need it some time to get a little bit sharper and maybe throw the ball? Yeah, but he's not needed to play against Calgary. We need to see what Cody Fajardo can do and the aforementioned other three guys. So if he's out there, it might be a couple plays or maybe a series or two. Like we asked uh, Craig today, was it too early to ask for his quarterback rotation? And Craig being his reg- Dickens being his regular self said, Yes, it is too early. They're not going to decide till Wednesday. They probably decided, but they won't tell us. So I don't. I don't expect to see too much of Zach on uh, Friday night. I think it's going to be the other guys, and we'll go from there. But yeah, I'm. I'm not panicking. I'm not. I'm. It's a concern. I don't know if we would have been saying if he'd gone eleven for eleven, or even had a five for ten, if we'd be saying yeah, all the concerns are trashed, and we, we Zach would be the guy that we expect from 2015. I think there's always going to be concerns until he gets his first hit and that stuff. So I don't, I don't put a whole lot of stock in what we'll see on Friday night from Zach, but I do put a lot of stock in what we'll see from the other guys. And I know backup quarterback talk is what we do in Saskatchewan, but someone's got to be the guy. So, and Cody Fajardo right now is, is leading that race by a sizable margin in my mind and can further en- enhance his value with a pretty good performance against the Stampeders. Murray, certainly Cody Fajardo is going to be the backup quarterback unless something insane happens and Zach gets hurt. Is David Watford the third string guy right now or is it time to get some new blood because David Watford hasn't really progressed maybe the way that this organization would like him to? So maybe that means it's Isaac Harker's time or uh, uh, Ty Ganji's time. Well, I don't I have to I don't think David Watford hasn't progressed the way the riders have thought he would. He's still a young guy that's basically Converted from a receiver, you know, quarterback to receiver, and come back. So they're they're being pretty patient with him. I, I don't think they're going to pull the plug on him any quickly. Like Harker had Harker and Ganji had their moments on the weekend, but that was against four stringers. I think there wasn't a whole lot of starters out there. And they, Harker's got a strong arm. Ganji, I still haven't quite got a, a grasp on what he does well, but he's out there. So I I don't think Watford. They're giving up on Watford by any stretch, Mitch. And I think they're going to uh, probably, in my mind. If when the season starts, it'll be Claris, uh, Fajaro, and uh, Watford as the three quarterbacks, and I think that's unless they bring in a veteran. And Rob and I both have a veteran in mind they could add that would be a whole lot of take a whole lot of concerns away, but they don't seem to want to go that way. That Rob and I seem to think the Kevin Glenn route is the way to go. So I'm not ready to concede a roster spot to David Watford just yet. No, uh, I'm not either. I, he, he's he's a he's a terrific athlete. Uh, is college quarterbacking numbers weren't exceptional his completion percentage yeah. was not exceptional in college and if you look at Brandon Bridges completion percentage in college that was a huge red flag as to lack of accuracy and mm-hmm. I just wonder if the same is going to hold true with with David Watford being that they have two young quarterbacks in here I think Fajardo's roster spot is safe obviously yeah. so is that Calaro's I think that one of the big questions is for that third is about that third third quarterback and who that is going to be i think there is a desire to groom the next young quarterback i.e darian durant back in the day i thought that guy could be marquise williams last year he was set adrift for whatever reason um it wouldn't surprise me to see david watford start the season as the third string quarterback 
But I think that Isaac Harker or Ty Ganji will be offered a practice roster spot. And if those guys continue to progress, I could see them making a move with David Watford, whether it be a deal or just a release, because this will be his, what, his third year here. And is he being groomed or is he just a body? And right now, I think he's just a body because... He hasn't dazzled when he's come in, when he's had to come in. We don't know if Harker or Ganji, what they can do, and we'll maybe get an implication to that on Friday as to what they can do. But right now, I'm with Rob. I'm not ready to give a roster spot to David Watford yet. And if I am, it's a tenuous one because I think I'll have one of those other quarterbacks on the practice roster. Well, I think there's going to be one of them. They're going to have to have four guys on the – one guy on the practice roster, Mitch, won't they? they got to – no, they, they've, they've done it in the they past. They did last year. I know, but I, I think if to keep grooming a guy, you're going to have to take one of the guys and put him on the practice roster. And then probably with a guy on the practice roster, Mitch, and grooming him, is he doesn't get very many reps. So it's almost whoever is on the practice roster gets maybe two or three or five reps in, in a practice. So it's not really giving him a good chance to groom him. So they have to get the – so if you have the third string guy, that's, that's the one maybe that can groom things. And I think Watford, in my mind, and I – I wish I, could, I did, he just looks a little better than the other guy, and I just think because of the Seval experience, he's used to the field, he's used to the to the rush, and he's used to going against the Riders' defense. It may give him a bit of an edge, but I'm not saying it's it's written in stone or anything like that. But in my mind, I, I think that's how I see things shaking out. But we could be wrong. Maybe Harker goes up there and lights it up and uh, comes out as as the third string guy. Man, this is a lot of discussion for the third string quarterback. But I'm, I'm going to catch Sorry, right? sorry, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to prolong that discussion. Who's the short yardage quarterback? Do they still use Nick Marshall in those situations? I haven't seen it. Is it going to be Cody Fajardo, even if he's number two? Uh, is, is there any sign as to who, who well, that be, short yardage guy is going to be? I honestly think it's going to be a quarterback. One of the three quarterbacks is going to be whoever on the roster is going to be the short yardage quarterback. So it won't be Nick Marshall. No, I don't think it's – I haven't seen Nick Marshall in short yardage yet, which is a good point. And I'm trying to remember that I think Craig mentioned it one day that he wanted to be uh, – They wanted a quarterback in that position. They think Nick Marshall needs to concentrate on being what he's really good at. Well, he's really good at short yardage, but he's really good at being cornerback. And I don't think, I don't, and he's really had a good camp here looking from that position when he's out there. So I think it's going to be one of the quarterbacks is going to be a short yardage quarterbacks. And uh, because one thing about Craig Diggins, he's a bit of a traditionalist, old school type of guy. He talks about running the ball. He talks about run, setting up the pass. The offensive line being the key. You got to have a good offensive line. Got to have strong defensive lines. And he's not kind of the thinking outside the box that Chris Jones would do, just to do things to shake things up and to make other defensive and offensive coordinators have to uh, uh, game plan against those thoughts. So, traditionalist coach, and I think he wants to have one of his quarterbacks handle short yard situations. Which is the way it is on most teams. So, but Nick Marshall was very good at it last year. So I don't. Maybe maybe that'll change next week when they uh, come back after a short week for practice and maybe work him in a little more. But I haven't seen Nick Marshall out there in short yardage yet. So. In case you're wondering, Murray McCormick is with us via phone or some sort of connection from yeah, training camp. I'm just Saskatoon. waving to everybody. That's that's why there's no presence. Uh, oh, there's no point. McCormick. We should have had like a Murray fathead here. sitting on the. Yeah, fathead, huh? I will. Well, you've seen those. Or fat hip. Fat hip, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing a shirt today, so you're kind of lucky today. i got a shirt on, and I'm sitting here in front of my computer. Or even like uh, a hover, you know, a Murray hologram or something that just hovers true. back and forth. But or, I think, don't they say uh, words are worth a thousand pictures? Some, something like that? Sure. Sure, how's that? Maybe One not. picture's worth a thousand words? Maybe something like that, too. There you bit. go. I hope, we, I hope not. I, <laughs> <laughs> the written word has some value. I'm, I'm gambling. Well, when I see a picture of you, Rob, there are a thousand words that come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and and th- that means 4,000 letters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned earlier, mer- receivers, um, how nobody stood out. It does seem, though, that KD Cannon has had a good camp and, yeah. and did, did perform well in the scrimmage. And whatever happened to Paul McRoberts? Is he this year's Terrence well, Dunn Award winner automatically? Do you want to sell some papers to her or do you want me to tell you about it now? Okay, we'll tell you about it now. He's got sinus and toothache issues. Actually, I'm writing about that, that wherever happened to Paul McRoberts. And I think it's a it's a thing to be cautionary about some guy lighting it up in training camp because it's a big step to go from training camp to uh, doing anything. Particularly. The only one I can remember, Rob, and you and I remember is Weston Dressler in 08. 
He was everything he was supposed to be and more in training camp and the Ricky camp. And Paul McRoberts, yeah, he just hasn't been out. He's still not out there today again. And I keep thinking, because he's, he's got to do that. So, yeah, don't get too high on guys and don't get too low on them at training camp. But it's more exciting when you can say a guy like McRoberts, who lit it up on that day too. Him and Kyron Moore were two guys. So Kyron Moore had a whole bunch of catches that day too. So, Murray, I know there was a lot of excitement after the draft with Justin McInnes and Braden Lenius coming to camp and coming to the Riders. Um, neither has really had an impact in the first week, and Lenius got hurt right off the bat. Yep. Uh, I know McInnes has been hobbled as well. How disappointing is it for the coaching staff not to have those guys in there? Because I think both of those guys were drafted to have an impact of some sort with this football team this well, year. Well, let's first off, it's not over for them yet. Like they, they needed to be here for the first week, but they still, these guys, they know, they have an idea they can play, so maybe if they can come back, they're just going to be behind. It has been disappointing. I was kind of looking forward to seeing what they do, except for about a half of a practice with Braden Linnaeus did, and I was very impressed with him. And then, you know, McKinnis was on the field yesterday for the walkthrough and then didn't make it to practice today for another, they're taking it very, case, very, very cautious with them. But I'm going to throw this out here, and I'm going to mention, it's given a chance for me to watch Corey Watson. And I know we've made fun of the fact they signed a 35-year-old receiver on a team that from a guy who's with a 10-year CFL career. But, boy, I've been impressed by Corey Watson. He's big, another big target, 6'3", 230 or 220 around that area. Good hands, good speed. Does everything you're supposed to do. And I, I'm thinking, you know, that position may be in a good spot with Watson. He can also block like crazy. So I, it's given me a chance to maybe appreciate why the Riders signed Watson, and he's more than just a uh, a special teams guy or a stopgap till these guys come here, which he is going to be because sort of later McKinnis and Linus are going to someone's going to have to stand up, or even Mitch Picton was out there today too. From uh, he had that great rookie camp and then somehow managed to pull some muscle in his lower body that put him off to the side. So they are getting healthy, but I, I've been really impressed with Corey Watson, and I'm pleasantly surprised with that. So maybe. There's a little it kind of eases the disappointment of the fact that two draft picks aren't here, that this veteran has kind of stepped up to maybe fill a hole that they didn't really think they'd have to worry about that much. Anyway. How does how does Patrick Lavoie factor into this? I'm trying to I'm trying to get my fourteen brain cells, thirteen brain cells, twelve brain cells around who's who the starting five receivers are going to be. And I think a lot of it's gonna depend on situations. Yeah. Uh I mean Lavoie can certainly be be helpful with the run game or the pass game. There's Corey Watson. So there's, there's two Canadians right there who can be ratio breakers and in, yeah. in terms of the pass game, you uh, name and Roosevelt is going to start. You got to think uh, Katie Cannon has got a great chance at a spot. There's Kyran Moore. And Sha- um, Shaq Evans. You know, Shaq Evans. I think he, um, he's battling a shoulder. He had shoulder surgery. So I don't know where he's, where he's going to start the season, but he hasn't really done a whole lot of, other than he runs and he runs patterns and stuff, but I don't know what Shaq Evans is going to be. Yeah, there. I don't think, I don't think Lavoie was really practicing much last week. See, I think it was the first day he was really out there. And they use a lot of tight two end, two tight end sets, which is really exciting to watch. But so I think he might be more in that role. I'm not quite sure where, where he's going to fit in. I think he's going to be, he's going to be key because he's such a good player and contributes so much. So, but yeah, the starting five. So let's go quickly. So Watson, uh, Kyran Moore, Roosevelt, uh, Katie Cannon, maybe, and Evans. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm not so quick to say Shaq Evans. But you're not a Shaq Evans guy, and you haven't been since he came here. I just I think they can. He's he'll suffice. Really I, I think he's sort of a barometer player. If they can find a better player than than Shaq Evans, and if that can be proven through through camp and then the preseason, I think I think you can say that they've improved the receiving core. If he's still playing, that tells me that they're okay. They'll the status quo. They're fine with the status quo, which wasn't sufficient last year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's, it's not much. It doesn't score a touchdown either yet, which is always a bit of a concern. Sorry, I was reading something on Twitter. But, but you're no. right. And Shaq <laughs> Evans didn't score a touchdown last year, but I know there was one game in Montreal where they had given him a touchdown and it was called back at the six-inch line. There was another game, I think it was against Winnipeg, the same thing happened. So Shaq Evans did have the potential to put the ball in the end zone. He was just a couple of inches short from yeah. doing so. I, I know that Shaq Evans has had a history of drops, but he's not the first receiver. He won't be the last receiver to have that. I just think that Shaq Evans is getting 
a raw deal. I, I, you know, I think because of his season last year, I think this kid can can play football. I just think he has to maybe get his focus right because I attribute that to drops. And I think if Shaq Evans can can get his head screwed on right, I think he can be a weapon for this offense. I agree. I agree. There's another guy they had, Malik Wilson, and he was another young receiver. And they they gave him a ton of touches on uh, in Saturday's uh, scrimmage for, as a returner and as a receiver, and he didn't really stand out much. And Kenny was one of these guys in the first week of camp. I was I noticed regularly making pretty nice catches and seemed to be open. And then the, the scrimmage he wasn't really as as effective as I thought he could be. So I think maybe the, he might have taken a step back. One of their young maybe, but as the same thing. So who's- Who's the returner or who are the returner? They've got so many oh. candidates. Malik Wilson as well is one. Christian yeah. Jones. Um, Has he practiced yet, Murray? No, he hasn't He's still practiced. on the injured yet. list, right? Still on the injured list. Marcus Thigpen, Kyron Moore. They've got a lot of guys. Got a lot. Uh, Luce's pure po- Purifoy. Luce's pur- Purifoy on kickoff returns last year was tremendous. Mm-hmm. And, they've got a wealth of, and of Ed kick Gainey's returners. Back, Ed Gainey's still back there can't, start trying to do what he can do. He wants to do that. I had them written down. When I, you know, I wouldn't that. risk Ed Gainey on a kick return. No, it's too valuable. Too valuable. He's having a good camp, by the way. I really think Ed Gainey is. You know, I keep trying to watch out for the rookies and the veterans. I keep going, holy smokes, Ed Gainey's out there. He's doing, he's doing very well. I'm trying to find as my, you as you would expect. Yeah, yeah. If a veteran of that prestige or caliber comes into camp and doesn't do yeah. well, and they don't, then there's a problem. They don't get a whole. Lot, I have. Sorry, they don't get a whole lot of reps either. The veterans, people have to realize, because they have all these other guys they're trying to look at. So it's not really a, a whole. You know, it's not all about them. It's about trying to find who the other guys can do things. Oh, is that one there? Murray, in talking to people in Saskatoon that have seen camp, Ed Gainey's name has come up as one of the veterans that's had a great camp. But the question asked to me, and I, I can't give them an answer because I haven't seen them yet and won't until Friday, and then God only knows how much they'll play. But that question's being asked already about what veterans might be on the bubble. Uh, has that talk even started yet? in Saskatoon because I would think it wouldn't until after the first preseason game is over. Well, there's, yeah, there's a few veterans. I think Mac, Mac Henry might be on the bubble just due to the fact that they Shabir, Shab, Charbel DeBuyer has played so well and uh, Jeremy Falk, he's an international, and the Chester Gates are both, both internationals. They may not fit it, but, but Mac Henry. But Mac Henry knew that coming in. He's 32. They sign a good young guy in, in DeBuyer as a draft pick, so that kind of puts him a little bit on the bubble. I kind of hate to say it, but maybe Dan Clark a little bit. I think, you know, that the fact that he was on the field today and practicing, there's nothing to say that's anything about what's going on with him. Because he, he, he knew he was going to be in battle. He's always in a battle to get his position. So he could be a little bit. But he, he was out practicing today. They think he's got. He's not going to play on Saturday, on Friday night against the Stampeders, but he'd probably play the next week. And we all know Dan was in that car accident, that single vehicle rollover on May 7th and was pretty badly hurt. So, but the fact to see his out here is really inspiring and good to see him doing that. But I, I kind of thought that maybe even coming into this with Brendan Labatt's a very good center. I think we all know that. And with him at center, with Blake and uh, Bladdock as the two guards and the two tackles and Coleman and uh, Cofield, that's a pretty good offensive line. And what do you do when you got Dakota Sheppy there and you got Clark? Something's got to give. And Something's got to give there. So and I, and since I'm not – don't want anybody to know to say I'm disparaging Dan Clark because I like Dan Clark and I, you know, in fact, I'm very, you know, you see what he went through and the fact that he's even practicing is such so such an amazing thing to do. But he was coming in on the bubble. He was going to come in the bubble regardless. So maybe that's another one. And I, I have I can't really think of that. Maybe Sam Hurl might be fighting for that with aluminium being in the uh, middle. He's going to be Mac and way Cameron Judge has looked in training camp as well. He's just been outstanding. Just shows how much that. Sam Hurl will be on the bubble in a sense that he may not be a starter on the defense, but he will be starting on all four special teams plays. And he's such a contributor in that key part of the game. And with the Riders losing, losing Jordan Reeves for the season for that knee injury, they're going to need some special teams help. And Sam can do all that and still maybe, you know, sub in for maybe, uh, I don't know if he can play Will. That's a big ask for him because his pass coverage isn't as strong as his run coverage. So, but maybe Sam Hurl might can be in the bubble. Loops. Yeah, not be on the bubble to not to be on the roster, but he may not be on the bubble to lose his starting position. Oh, he's going to lose his starting middle linebacker position, I think. And with him, with uh, Judge and him both sort of seeing time at will. So maybe that's it. That's I, got, I got a few bubble guys in mind. I mean, we've talked about Shaq Evans. I still think they can 
they can do better than that. Um, yeah. you, you look at the offensive line, something has got to give there. Um, what if Charleston Hughes and the way he finished the season last year uh, is indicative of performance early in the season? Charleston Hughes, AC Leonard, I'm Charles. AC Leonard was a was a healthy scratch for the playoffs last year. Mm-hmm. I just wonder if, if if Chad Jeter is having a good camp. Yeah. Is is if Charleston Hughes ends up looking like he's thirty five years old? Is is that one that's that's questionable, that's or am point. I really reaching here? Is, think, is production really, really dropped off, at least statistically, after yeah. about the sixty game, to seventy percent mark of the season last game year? Game thirteen, he had what? He had thirteen sacks at game thirteen, and then had two after that. Some how had... much of that was though? And I'd have to go back and look at the film. How much of that was? You know what? We need to stop Charleston Hughes, and efforts were being made to do that. Because Willie Jefferson really started to make his impact in that final third of the season. And I'm just wondering, did the focus shift to Hughes allowing Jefferson to make more plays? Or did Charleston run out of gas, as some have suggested? Well, I know I asked Jefferson about that last year. And Jefferson said they're still focusing on Charleston Hughes. And part of that was part of the reason why Jefferson had such an explosive second half of the season. I, I really wish I could say Charleston Hughes has stood out at training camp. But at the same time, this first nine days haven't been about the starters as much it's been about guys backing up so that's why chad jeter has has looked pretty good i like this uh, jeremy Falk guy he's a another big tight end a kind of guy that's had some good rush and ac leonard has played well wrong i think i still i'm, I'm going to talk to him find out why he got benched sooner or later but he's look he's got those long arms and he just seems to be i i just think the option they could have with a three-man front and i know you loved it so much last year but you think of Charleston Hughes, Micah Johnson, and AC Leonard as a three-man front. That's pretty formidable. And then, so but then, what do you do with with Zach Evans? I know you're so, paying Zach Evans a lot of money. They yeah. can't go with a three-man front that much, can they? Well, considering the money they've invested in their yeah. defensive line, I, the, if you look at Micah Johnson and and, and Zach Evans, you've a, got over four hundred thousand dollars locked up in those two positions. I think point. they can do that situationally on second and long because Micah Johnson is a threat to get to the quarterback. Zach Evans isn't. So I think on second and no, long. Zach was. I think Zach was. Yeah, he had, one, he had one sack. But last year, I think I, in, on, last year was an on, aberration. I think Zach, Zach with, with Micah Johnson there is going to get back. He had one year at five sacks, didn't he? Five no, but what I'm saying, Murray, is if it comes to a 3 4 defense, I think you can take Zach Evans off the oh, field yeah, oh, yeah. knowing that Micah Johnson's going to get more pressure on the quarterback. That's not a disparaging statement against Zach because I think on first down, you have to have Zach Evans in there on second and, and four or less. You have to have Zach Evans in there. But I'm thinking on second and long, if you want to go three, four, you can take Zach out and still be okay because of the pressure that Micah Johnson can can put up. Or go three, nine the way they did, <laughs> often did last year. <laughs> yeah. I know we talked the secondary is going to be really good. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I I just think of the starting five of Marshall, Ganey, Edom, Edom, and Purifoy and Butler or something like Eli, Eli, Eli Buco has had his up and down type of day. I thought he could, he's kind of like the backup cornerback to Butler. So maybe he'll push Butler a little bit, but he's had some inconsistent days, but you know, that secondary is going to be really strong. And so is the linebackers, but it's just, as we go back to where we kind of started this whole conversation, it's what the offense does. The offense. So it, ultimately it's going to come down to that. Murray, again, uh, I haven't seen him perform. I know, uh, I've heard you say that he's the first guy out every day. I've heard people say that John Ryan is absolutely booming the football. Uh, what have you seen from him in week one? Uh, you know, I, I'm expecting him to be kicking the ball 45, 46 yards an average this year. I expect nothing different from him than what I saw with him in Seattle. Uh, what have you seen from him? And is he sort of reinvigorated after having a year off? I think it's just punting the way he could punt. Like he's still good. Like 37 isn't old for a punter. How old was Bob Cameron when he punted? 75? 81. Yeah. <laughs> 46, I think, in final year. And, yeah, he's everything you mentioned, Mitch. He's doing all those things. He's working with the other guys. It's funny to watch him. I was watching today and to watch him how they're working on holding and how they put the ball to this quarter and square and how he, he does all that stuff. So he does everything well. I think – I said to somebody, I said, what do you think about the signing of Mike of John Ryan? And he goes, but it's a good signing. It's a sign they needed. It's funny. They needed better punting. And we just kind of, because maybe Josh was such a good guy, we kind of overlooked his stats a little bit. But I think John Ryan's did everything he's been advertised for. He's still the first guy out, still works. 
the, I see this thing. There's more, a little more laughing maybe because John's a pretty funny guy too. So he's kind of keeps things loose in that way and stuff. But yeah, he hasn't disappointed. And I think he's going to probably get the largest cheer of anybody, maybe after Zach Claris on that first home game. Playoff game? No, I'm joking. Oh, I think, I think John Ryan will get the louder ovation. Uh, I, I think we could get a standing ovation for a punter for the first time in football <laughs> that's history. A, that's I'm not joking. Did. Yeah, I know. It's not, I know. I'm joking. I'm thinking every bit about that. But but John's so humble, and he, he knows what his job is. It's not to be the superstar. It's to be the punter. And the whole fact, the fact that they're probably going to be punting a lot is a pretty good reason to have him on the roster, I think so. When he booms one, what do they look like? How high, oh, high. are these? Go, I haven't seen John Ryan punt since oh. uh, September of 2006. Well, you didn't see him kick in the Super Bowl when the Seahawks pasted the Broncos. Oh, yeah, that's oh, right. When Fe- I, get I compare him to Felix Menard Brie, <laughs> who was a young kicker trying to do it. Brie's punts are kind of like not very high. They're, they're powerful, but they're just kind of normal looking CFL punts. And then John Ryan comes in and they go over the standards and you look it up and you get a sore neck trying to find a ball and stuff. They're just, and they sound that different, that different thud of a really hard kick ball. And he does that all the time. And, and then they also, you know, they're working directionally too. It's not, it's not all going to be 50 yard boomers. He's got to, you know, hit him to spots. And he's dealing with the fact that if you kick the ball out of bounds inside, outside the twenties, it's a penalty. And he's going to learn those rules. So it is fun. Listen to him. It's fun listening to John punt the ball. It's even more fun watching him kick it so he's been everything is advertised and uh yeah a punter could be the face of the riders that's just a a crazy kind of a season in that way mitch do you have any final thoughts before we send murray on his way to actually write something well today? as i said i just think you know like a lot of other people that haven't been able to to see this football team at training camp but you can read all about it in the leader well post. yeah you can read all about it or you can listen daily at four to the sports cage with Derek taylor bad guest host on thursday coming up though. oh terrible or best terrible. bad co-host part yeah me. terrible that you're still coming in right? yeah i'll be i'll see okay, you thursday okay. um i just want to see what this team looks like uh you know there there are guys on this roster i've heard things about uh we've talked about a lot of them on this podcast uh, I just want to see what these guys are all about. And, you know, you brought up Chad Jeter's name. I want to see if he's taken another progression. I want to see how A.C. Leonard looks. Uh, I do want to see how Zach Kalaros looks, even if it's only a couple of series. Yeah. I want to see how David Watford looks. Uh, you know, I don't know if McKinnis is going to play. I know Lenius won't. If McKinnis plays, I want to see how he looks. Uh, I there's just those McKin- questions that, yeah, and I doubt it too. Yeah. But there's just those questions that you get every year when we can't see these guys because we're up in Sask or because they're up in Saskatoon and we're down here, it's that first preseason game where you start to sort of go, okay, this is what I've heard. And again, as we all know, um, there are guys that do great in practice, and then you turn on the lights and they're terrible, and vice versa. So I want to see them play against the Calgary Stampeders. I want to see who stands out. I want to see who has a tough time, and then we'll move on to the second preseason game and. Uh, and go from there. There's something about turning on the lights. I, I was having a good day. I thought I was going to be in good form. And then Mark Melnichuk, our producer, turned on the lights for the podcast. And I just really have had nothing today and have been substandard. Uh, Murray, do you have any uh, final closing thoughts? Anything uh, you'd like to disparage me about? No, I or can't. Or am I taking I've, care of that? I've pretty well covered all uh, everything i like to say. Uh, maybe we'll pump a little bit. We're going to delve into the global players. This Max Zimmerman scored a touchdown, which was pretty cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> was pretty Do we cool. Need to get a medic? Are you okay? <laughs> uh, pretty cool. That's weird. Eh? Pretty cool in the in that so my third. Pretty cool. Fourth. Pretty cool. Uh, in the mock scrimmage, which is <laughs> nice to see that uh, he's he's so ripped and stuff. And I think the finest compliment I could play to Max Irm is I always think he's like a Canadian out there. <clears throat> he doesn't look like a guy who's. Uh, Hasn't played a whole lot of Canadian football. Sorry, guys, I got to take a drink. Which of these phones should I use to dial nine? Yeah, I'm dialing nine one one as we speak, Murray. Uh, oh, that's weird. <coughs> what was that clank? Was that your fake? Was that your fake hip? <coughs> that was my water bottle. Okay. Maybe it's all that jambalaya I had last night. Or the Riders trying trendy. to catch the ball last season. Yeah, uh, Murray. That's maybe the biggest question: <laughs> is how many restaurants has the football foodie checked out in Saskatoon, and are you now basically? Just getting free meals because you are the football foodie. Well, I think I should get free meals because I am the football foodie, but I don't get many. That I just go when I haven't been to as many. I've been trying to avoid. I'm right across the field street from the stadium, so there's no place to eat around here. So I've loaded up on people's salads and those sort of things. Gee, yes. well, I mean, it's, I know it's not very exciting, but you got to. There's a football foodie. Is Ariel foodie. making you lunch? Hmm? 
Sorry? Is Ariel making you lunch? No, no, no. I buy him at Sobeys. Oh. Anyway, so right. another touch. But yeah, uh, Saskatoon has some great restaurants, but it's been busy. Like Saturday night, I was going to go out and the Raptors game was on. So I got watch it in my room. Go to Taverna. I want to go to Taverna. Yeah. Maybe I'll go there. Vitello El Limoni is so good. If you're divorced, don't order the Vitello El Limoni at Taverna. <laughs> I've been to uh, Taverna, and I remember one of the- Taverna is so great. The lemon veal, it's so good. When I was there, I just turned my whole menu over to the server, and he came up with these great seafood pasta salads and the seafood pasta, and it was so awesome. I have to go there. There's just not many nights. You know, Tonight, there's a hockey game on, and I have to find a bar with a TV. Wendell Clark's. Wendell Clark's. Wendell Clark's is good. It was good. I was there the other night. Original Joe's is good. Original Joe's. Um, Shoeless Joe's is another great place. Uh, the Wild Wings? Oh, sorry. That's mine. Not in, yeah. Milestones. Milestones is one of my favorites. That's another a chain. I know people say I'm not supposed to go to chains, but boy, Milestones serves up great food, and I love going there. Well, we, this is called Rider Rumblings, but I think Stomach Rumblings would be more <laughs> yeah, applicable exactly, right now. Exactly, because I, got, I can I'm, see my salad sitting on the counter from here. Well, we're not going to keep you from that any longer. Um, I hope you recover. You don't sound well. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> training Mitch, camp is long I, I may sound it's a long haul I don't think people realize what nine days are like up here so Mitch is now eating raw peas etc yes. in order he's lost at least yes. uh, eight pounds so congratulations Mitch on that thanks Rob We're, I've gained those eight pounds that you've you have <laughs> forsaken okay. I have to read this it's a it's a it's a post media rule please rate us on iTunes and leave a review it helps us grow the podcast and in my case the podcaster if you'd like to send us a question you can email me at rvanstone at postmedia.com and we'll read your question on the show Mitchell Blair See, Kieran, thank you so much for being with us today. Rob, the pleasure's been all yours as always. <laughs> Murr, thank you so much, and we hope that you, you do rally and are able to get your stories done today before going to the hospital. Yes, I will. I'm feeling better already. Just saying goodbye and to Mitch and you. It's how me. For Murray and Mitch, I'm Rob Vanstone. <laughs> um, take care of yourself and of each other. Is that the Jerry Springer ending? Sure. Yeah. Anyway, like thank you so much, and we'll do this again uh, next week. Maybe this may be the end of our podcast series now that we've degenerated so badly. In the Play the music, roll them. <laughs> Goodbye.